Well, I've been so looking forward to this day. We're actually in the halfway point of this summer sermon series, working through 13 significant verses in Scripture. Romans 12, verses 9 through 21. We're just now starting week 7, and we've been going literally one verse per week at a time. It started all the way back in June, answering the question, what the world, what is the world? What does the world need right now? And it's this, faithful followers of Christ, not just being people who believe in heart and in mind, but people who, as they follow Jesus, that their faith turns into action. Because Paul says in these 13 verses, there are 38 verbs compared to about 21 nouns that define our action, our activity, our life as followers of Jesus. In that first week, we talked about love without hypocrisy. If this is your first Sunday, welcome. You can get caught up as you go to YouTube and search for that sermon, Love Without Hypocrisy. We find ourselves right now in Romans 12, verse 15, in this seventh week of this summer series. And this passage perhaps is familiar to some of you. I'm going to go right to it. And I love the fact that as we come to this, this is God's word. This is not just literature. This is not just a human's opinion. It's not just a, a list of principles to put up on the bookshelf among other great books. Scripture says about itself that this is God breathed. That though penned by human hands, it was the spirit of God communicating the heart of God to all of humanity. And so wherever you are, whoever you are, my prayer is that the spirit of God would get me out of the way and that it would be God's heart and God's word that would resonate deeply in your life. I often pray. I don't say this very often, but I often pray, Spirit of God, would you translate the words of my mouth so by the time they hit people's ears, they hear what you want them to hear. So let's get to Romans 12. Verse 15, very famous passage of scripture. The apostle Paul writes this. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. This, my friends, is the reading of God's word. And as we say every week, thanks be to God. So rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. All right, we're done. I mean, literally, like, how can I preach on this? On one hand, it's so simple. It's so common sense to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. I mean, how can I fill 40 minutes of time unpacking what this might be? And it reminds me that if I was just to get up here and give a speech, I, I frankly wouldn't have much to say. But I don't see this moment as that. I really believe that I need to step into this moment to decrease so that Christ may increase. I pray that it would be God's heart God's truth that I can simply be a messenger of. And as I've been praying for this moment, preparing for this moment, studying for this moment, I, I got this sense, I got this just impression that while so simple on the surface, there are actually very significant things in our lives that get in the way of us rejoicing with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep as Paul longs for us to do. In fact, I believe that there's four feelings under the surface that can actually get in the way of putting this into practice. You know, we live in a, a time, especially in the West, where we are told to trust our feelings, to be led by our feelings. And if we do allow that, then we get steered in a direction that's very contrary to God's heart. But as we understand our feelings, as we understand our emotions, Scripture actually tells us to speak to and to lead our emotions and feelings. It's not to disregard them. It's not to bury them. But it's not to elevate them to be at the place that only Christ deserves as Lord of our life. So let's walk through these four feelings that I believe get in the way of Rejoice with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep. Now, I, I know that as you likely hear some of these, and this is very natural and very human, you might begin to hear and say, oh, I, I know somebody just like that. And of course, that's natural for us to, to see and others uh, 
where we fall short. But here's my hope and here's my prayer. And this is what I've done in preparation for today. I've asked Spirit of God, would you help me not just to look elsewhere, but would you, by the power of the Spirit, look at me? Search me, O oh God. And are there any of these feelings that I have maybe fallen into a trap or I've fallen into the pattern of, and I might not even be aware of it, that are actually preventing me from getting in the way, from not living into this great invitation of living as an ambassador for Jesus. So, first feeling. Some of you are familiar with apathy and uh, sympathy and empathy. Well, you might not know, I didn't know this until this week, actually. Uh, the very end of the spectrum is a word antipathy. Now, antipathy, of course, is right next to apathy and then sympathy and empathy all the way over here. You might even hear in those English words, the last two syllables, pathy. It comes from the Greek word pathos, which originally had the meaning of suffering. Pathology is not the study of suffering, but it's the study of disease. And so, of course, in the ancient Greek language, pathos had a very negative connotation. But over time, pathy and especially antipathy and apathy and sympathy and empathy have come to be a way to describe one's feelings in relation to somebody else's feelings. So antipathy, by definition, kind of our modern definition, is you feel the opposite of what somebody else feels. So when they're rejoicing, you're weeping. And when they're weeping, you are rejoicing. And I believe the root of antipathy is actually self-righteousness. And what scripture defines as self-righteous is that you as a person have become the definer of what is good and what is bad. You as a person have within yourself the measuring stick with which you measure the rest of the world. And there are certain people, maybe people you're related to or work with or neighbors or maybe former friends or people that you see from afar. Maybe it's entire people groups or maybe it's a group of people that wear a uniform that represent a certain ideology and you see in them people who don't measure up to your definition of righteousness. It is very natural for you because of that self-righteousness to have feelings of antipathy towards them. A person who you have a perspective of that you believe deserves not success, but deserves a ruin. When you see them succeed, when you see them get the part, when you see them get the job promotion, when you see them happy, you get angry, you lament, you weep. You might say to yourself, or you might say to other people, they, they don't deserve that. That might actually cause you to spring into action and try to discredit their success, to dismantle their success. Or maybe if you have, from a feeling of self-righteousness, antipathy towards them, that when they have ruin, when they have destruction, when they are weeping, it causes you to rejoice because finally, let's face it, they're getting what they deserve. Antipathy, by definition, makes it impossible for us to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Now, you might say, I don't have antipathy towards my family. I don't have antipathy towards uh, people in my workplace. I, I don't have antipathy towards my friends. Well, maybe your sample size is too small. Of course, it's easy to rejoice with people whom we love. Of course, it's natural for us to weep with those whom we resonate with. But I believe Paul is asking us to expand our sample size, to look out not just at those who are like us, but actually to look beyond the people who are even followers of Jesus and to even rejoice with them the way God would rejoice with them. We'll get to that at the end of the sermon. And to weep with them the way that God would weep with them. We'll get to that at the end of the sermon. And I wonder, and I, if honestly, sharing with you, 
as I allow the Spirit of God to, to search me, I, I, I do think that there are times when I look out beyond those like me, look out beyond those whom it's easy to love. I look out on certain people or certain actions that people are doing and it is, it's actually possible for me to have antipathy towards them and I, I rejoice when they weep and I weep when they rejoice. How about you? Are there people that you either know personally that have maybe wronged you in the past or people that you've never even met before that you look out upon and you hear of their success and it causes you to be distraught or when they have destruction, you are rejoicing and finally feel vindicated. I'm telling you, that is getting in the way of living into the life that Christ calls us to live. When I do that, it gets in the way of what Christ wants to do in and through me. And you know, antipathy is, a, of course, an obvious thing that gets in the way of Romans 12, 15. But let, let, let's keep working our way through. Let, let's take a look at the second feeling that gets in the way of Romans 12, 15. It's apathy. So apathy is an inability to feel what somebody else feels. It is when someone is rejoicing, you're not rejoicing. It's when somebody is weeping, you're not weeping. I believe that uh, in that moment, the thing that causes one to feel apathy is self-centeredness. It is when a person sees themselves as the center of the universe and to have that level of a gravitational pull that all things exist around you naturally would cause you to not feel what other people feel. You're either too busy to even notice, you're too self-absorbed to even care, uh, you're too focused on keeping the conversation to even notice. Maybe you've seen these conversations. Maybe you've been in these conversations. You know, you're talking to somebody and you're, you're sharing something great and you're hoping that they would celebrate with you, that they'd rejoice with you. And as soon as you tell, you know, I, I've been saving up and I'm, I'm going to go on vacation and it's been so long since I've been able to get away and I just, I can't wait. Isn't that awesome? And if they immediately launch into telling their story about how they're looking forward to their vacation without even acknowledging what you just said, likely it's coming from a self-centered place that leads to apathy, they're not even able to feel what you're feeling. Or maybe you've had it where you're, where you're trying to share a story about something that you just lost or a disappointment and a person whom you're sharing it with uh, doesn't engage with you in it, but then tells their story about their own loss, their own disappointment. Likely it's because that person has fallen into this trap of just self-centeredness. And they're not engaging with, they're not even feeling what you're feeling. What about you? Do you think that there are times in which you have been apathetic towards others? Look, and let's expand our sample size. You know, you might say, okay, I've never been apathetic with my family, but maybe I have with a coworker or a friend. But expand it even farther. Are you apathetic to some of the suffering that is happening in the world? Are you apathetic to some of the rejoicing that has happened in the world? I truly believe that that feeling of apathy, which comes from self-centeredness, is a huge thing that gets in the way of Romans 12, 15, to truly be able to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. But the third feeling that gets in the way. It's a good feeling, but it still gets in the way. It's the feeling of sympathy. Now, sympathy, by definition, as we move our way towards empathy, sympathy is closer to it. It is being able to see and to acknowledge, to notice the feeling of another. And I believe that uh, being able to notice is moving away from self-centeredness. But the, the origin, the catalyst, the root of sympathy, I believe, is self-importance. 
You are prioritizing yourself. You're not the center of the universe, but you are prioritizing yourself over somebody else. And maybe you are too busy. Uh, you don't have time to really engage, but you notice uh, but you see and you're able to be sympathetic when people uh, weep and you're able to notice people's rejoicing, but you don't enter into it. That still falls short of what the Apostle Paul is talking here. Because still there is, let's face it, an emotional distance that occurs when we just see somebody else's feelings and don't enter into it with them. We might do the bare minimum. We might send a little card with sympathy. We might send a text, congrats. Hey, we're, we're, we're moving closer to God's heart for how we can interact with other people as it relates to 1215 of Romans, but it still falls short because it is not to the level of engagement that God longs for us to have. Sometimes sympathy can actually just lead to, to pity uh, it can actually move us to a condescending, I, I, I see your suffering, but I'm going to pity you. And it's a, it's a condescending way. Or if somebody's rejoicing, we might be able to see it, but, but we're not really engaging and rejoicing with them because perhaps there's, there's a level of jealousy or a level of bitterness because we're not experiencing that as well. Okay, we have antipathy and apathy and sympathy. And now we've got what often is heralded and lifted up as the greatest feeling of all. And it's empathy. And empathy is an ability to feel what somebody else feels. It's an ability to, to feel somebody's joy and to feel somebody's weeping and lamenting. But I got to tell you, as I understand empathy, as I've, as I've studied scripture, I still believe that that feeling of empathy still gets in the way of truly rejoicing with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep the way God defines it. And I believe that empathy comes from a place of self-reliance. Let me explain this. All of these emotions have to do with our strength and our ability and truly stem from self. And though empathy is lifted up and heralded as one of the greatest feelings you can have towards somebody else, the resource, the power for empathy, by definition, is inside of you. And so to grow in empathy, we are told that you've got to, as a person, just spend more time with people, which isn't a bad thing. To hear their stories, which isn't a bad thing. To put yourself in their shoes, which isn't a bad thing. But it's to truly feel within yourself what the other person feels. There can be a shadow side of that because by definition, it is relying on the self. You see, one of the shadow sides of empathy, feeling the joy of people when you're around them and, and feeling the anguish and the sorrow of people when you're around them. If you're relying on your own strength and just trying to be empathetic and just trying to feel what they feel, over time, you will become burnt out. Maybe this is you right today, that there are people in your life that are going through so much stuff and you are exhausted. You are at the end of yourself. Uh, you, you are such an empathetic person, which on one hand is a beautiful thing, but there's a shadow side when you rely on your own strength. And this happens when you give yourself in service to somebody else and you are not able to rely on something outside of yourself, which we'll get to in a moment, but when you're relying on your own strength, there's an extent, there is a limit to how much weeping you can do. And you can become callous to it. You can become numb to it. You can begin to cope just to be able to sustain it. And we're in this cultural moment right now where there is so much anguish in the world around us. And I've received so many notes from people, phone calls from people, pastoral requests from our team saying, I can't handle the level of grief in the world. 
People are saying, I, I, I feel sick inside. I feel paralyzed. I feel numb. I feel drained because of all that's going on. And I believe because people are holding up empathy as the solution. But by definition, let me say it again, I'll repeat myself. Empathy by definition is relying on your own strength to feel what other people feel. And there are limits to our ability to truly engage and sustain that level of empathy in other people's lives. It is a self-reliance by definition. I'm gonna master this, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna keep showing up, I'm gonna be that friend. And I'm telling you, it falls short of what Christ is calling us to through Paul in this passage. Because if we just aim for empathy, which often is how this passage is interpreted, which often is how this passage is defined, then we just find ourselves being chameleons or thermometers that change our mood related to whatever somebody else's mood is. And after a while, the yo-yo of emotions is exhausting. I can tell you this from personal experience. I can't think of many other professions other than a pastor that experiences the wide range of human emotions. I get to rejoice with people in some of the highest moments of their life. And I get to weep with people in some of the darkest moments of their life. I have been in the room with people the moment where reconciliation happens after 10 years worth of animosity. That is a beautiful moment. There's so much rejoicing. I've stood in officiating weddings. I've come to baptize babies. I mean, these, these high points, these amazing moments, celebrating with people when, when their dreams come true. But I've also been in the room when somebody hears for the first time that a child has just been killed. I've been in the room with people counseling somebody through a dark depression and addiction. I've been in the house with kids when their parent attempted to take their own life. I've been in that situation as it was happening. Praise God, they survived. But I'm telling you, empathy falls short. It's no wonder where people in help professions, and it's far more than just pastors, why chaplains, why counselors, while nurses and doctors have some of the highest levels of burnout. When empathy is the goal, it falls short. But there's something even deeper, something way beyond antipathy and apathy and sympathy and empathy, and it's compassion. And compassion is light years, is in a, a different solar system, a different galaxy, a completely different world than those. Because compassion, by definition, isn't rooted in the self. Compassion, the way God defines it through Scripture, is something that's rooted in Christ. It is impossible to be compassionate the way God calls us to be compassionate, relying on the self. And in fact, when we look at Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, who is God in the flesh, wherever Jesus went, Jesus was compassionate. He never had antipathy. He never had apathy. He had more than sympathy and he more, had more than empathy because his feelings as he engaged with people's joy and his feelings as he engaged with people's weeping spurred him to action that honored the heart of God. I want to give you one example. I'm going to read this to you. A very famous passage of scripture. This is in uh, the book of John. There's a moment where one of his friends, somebody whom he knew prior to this moment, named Lazarus, had been reported as dead. And in John 11, 
long passage. Maybe you want to read this later before your head hits the pillow. Perhaps read all of John 11. I'm going to pick up in verse 28 where John records Jesus as this. When she had said this, she went back, this is Martha, and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher, this is about Jesus is here, and is calling for you. And when she heard it, this is Mary, she got up quickly and went to him, to Jesus. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her. There's grief, of course, Lazarus, their brother, had died. Saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. But Mary went to Jesus. Verse 32, when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Listen to this. This is beyond sympathy. This is beyond empathy. This is compassion. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. If I stopped there, that would just be empathy. He was feeling what they felt. He was disturbed as they were disturbed. He was weeping as they were weeping. But compassion, taking action, the way that he believed God the Father was calling him to take action, moved him in the midst of that grief, in the midst of the weeping, in the midst of the empathy. And this is what happened. Verse 34, he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? Then again, verse 38, then Jesus again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. This is compassion. This is inaction now to honor God the Father for glory for the Father. It was a cave and a stone was lying there. And Jesus said, take away the stone." Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he had been dead four days. It's important to understand that in Jewish culture, if you have been dead longer than three days, there's no opportunity for resurrection. There's no possibility that this is going to get reversed. In other words, John is saying this man is dead as dead can be. It's the fourth day. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? You see, Jesus uses this opportunity not just to meet her and the Jewish people where they were, but to meet them where they were, to spring into action, to reveal God's heart all for the glory of God. He says this, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Verse 41, so they took away the stone and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. In the Greek language, John is saying that he roars at the tomb like a lion, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face unwrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to him, unbind him and let him go. This picture of Jesus entering into the most sorrowful moment, but going beyond it to point them to a loving God, to transform the grief into joy. And that's what Jesus has come to do. He enters into our joys to point us to the truest joy that can be found in him. He enters into our weeping to meet us there, to understand it all, to actually transform it so that one day we will find joy in him. It's fascinating, Isaiah 53, the links that Jesus goes to, to relate with and to experience our feelings. In Isaiah 53, it says this. 
He was despised, this is verse 3 of Isaiah 53, he was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one whom others hide their faces from, he was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne, he has weared, he has carried our infirmities and he's carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. By his bruises, we are healed. What this prophecy in Isaiah is saying hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus is that one day there would be one, a Messiah, whom would wear upon himself, who wouldn't just see, who wouldn't just feel, but would truly experience all the sorrow, all the hurt, all the anguish, all the grief that has ever been experienced in all of humanity. He's going to experience all of it upon himself. And through that transformative action, we will be healed. And that is the great invitation that the Apostle Paul is trying to open our minds to. That when we move beyond ourselves and we look to Jesus as truly the only compassionate one, the one who alone can carry the suffering of the world, then we as followers of Christ can allow Christ in and through us to extend that compassion, not through our own strength, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. By definition, compassion is something that is impossible for us as human beings. By definition, we can never rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep if we rely upon ourselves. But if we allow the Spirit of God to allow Christ in and through us, then it is Christ through us rejoicing with those who rejoice. And it is Christ through us weeping with those who weep. Let's move beyond antipathy, apathy, sympathy, and empathy. And let's long that Christ would be compassionate through us. We move from self-righteousness to Christ-righteousness. We move from self-centeredness to Christ-centeredness. We move from self-importance to Christ-importance. We move from self-reliance to Christ-reliance. That will unlock so much in your life. Settle for nothing less than Christ accomplishing that rejoicing and that weeping through you for the transformation of those around you. We can lean into this. We can practice this. Let's start today and let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that you have a level of compassion unlike anyone that has ever existed. So may we stop trying to be you. May we lay down our needs to accomplish what only you can accomplish. And may we with a deep reliance, a deep trust, a deep openness through the power of the Spirit, invite you, Jesus, to extend compassion to everyone around us. May it stretch us, not just for our family and friends and our neighbor and our coworkers, but even those to the ends of the earth. Jesus, we thank you that you have come, that you have set us free, all for your glory. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.